Hello and welcome to a new week's edition of our online class. Hope you guys had a good first week, a good weekend off, ready to get back now added here in week two. Got a little added bonus. Um, told you before, my office is here in the football building at the south end zone of Jones AT&T Stadium. And as we speak, got a camp going out on the uh, on the field right now. They're having one of their summer camps. And uh, we get a little extra music to go along with what we're doing uh, today. I don't know if you can hear that or not. Speaking of uh, audio, I have had uh, an email or two about the audio being too low, so hopefully I've messed with the uh, microphones and hopefully that is better. Let me know on the message board or an email if it's not any better. Hopefully it's a lot better and a lot easier for us uh, uh, to hear going forward. Again, just want to get a couple things going. You have the paper due uh, the first paper that is due on uh, Tuesday, so make sure you get that done. That Just email that to me if possible, and then uh, keep putting your thoughts on the discussion slash message board uh, because, again, we talked about uh, class participation, 50 points, just basically giving you 50 points towards uh, your overall total if you just put a couple thoughts in. And you know what? That just replaces just us talking in class. So... If I'm in class asking questions um, and you guys interact with each other and with me, and this is just what the message board uh, gives us that kind of one-on-one uh, -on -one here in the class. And again, it's a free, easy uh, 50 points for you going forward. And your papers that you do, which would be worth a total of 100 points, we'll do five 20-point papers. Uh, really easy, too, as long as you don't make any huge, massive uh, mistakes, any typographical errors that are just egregious in nature, lose, spelled like loose, something like that, then then we'll be okay, and that should be, um, that should be good for you also. So um, as we go forward, um, just remember that. Keep the message boards going and the discussion boards. Uh, get your papers turned in and watch, um, watch these daily lectures. And so speaking of these daily lectures, um, Let's go to that right now because we're going to talk today about ethics of management. And, you know, when you take an online class, there's a bit of ethics in there, too. I'm taking a leap of faith. You're watching the videos. Uh, you're paying attention. Probably not so much. And I'm not sure how much of an ethical issue that is. But we deal with ethical things every day in our lives, um, every day as managers. Uh, you face this different ethical consequences. So... What we want to go through today on uh, today's class is talking about uh, the role ethics play in managerial decision making. Um, people have different norms they use that they consult to making ethical decisions. We'll touch on those, uh, how organizations and individuals use ethical codes of conduct. And of course, we have mission statements to define what is important to us and the common ethical issues faced by media management today and how to implement an ethic, ethics program in electronic media organizations. So I'll try to go through all of that today. And, and again, ethics are something hard really to teach, I think, because either sometimes you either have them or you don't. Um, but, but I think for the most part, uh, most of us want to do the right thing. I, I've heard ethics described as uh, what you do when no one's looking. And um, I think that's really a very simple answer to it, right? What, what you can do. Managers make... Numerous decisions on a day-to-day -day basis uh, involving a lot of different things. It doesn't necessarily have to be something ethically related. It could be. And um, one of the things I always think about is the budget. And you deal with ethical issues uh, with the budget all the time. Do we really need these certain things? Do we really need... One of the things we have here, um, we have an Under Armour budget because we're an Under Armour school. Under Armour gives us a certain amount of uh, clothing a year. Uh, they want us wearing it as much as possible, representing Texas Tech. Almost every day you'll see me here in an Under Armour shirt of some sort. And so we look at the budget and we say, hey, do we need this much Under Armour gear of this year? Doesn't everyone have enough Under Armour? Um, and you should have to balance, hey, what do, you, what do we want just personally versus what's right uh, for the department? We make decisions all the time in personnel. Um, have people all the time asking me, hire my friend, hire my brother, hire my 
sister-in-law, whatever. You have to decide, is this the right person for the job? And again, I run a marketing promotions um, area. We get lots of stuff that we give away, and uh, you have to make ethical decisions about those things too. We can't all be Oprah and give everyone a taco all the time. So those are different areas that you say, hey, is this stuff really something that um, – is this something that I can take? Is this something I can give to people? You know, um, I had something happen where um, I had a great deal. I got Fuddruckers a really good deal, uh, a catering deal here on campus with somebody. And uh, the Fuddruckers guy just out of the blue gave me a $200 gift card. Said, hey, thanks for the um, thanks for the, the business. Thanks for giving, me, giving that to me. And I didn't do it for that. I did it because I thought they were the best person to cater what we were doing, and so um, I had to give the uh, gift card back to him and, and couldn't keep it because ethically it wasn't the uh, wasn't the right thing to do. So again, you just see all kinds of different um, areas where you have to have to mess with something. So I wanted to talk about a situation that I, you know, we have we haven't talked a lot about my personal situation, but before I came over here to um, work in um, before I came over here to work at athletics, I was the uh, station manager for KTTZ, the, the public television station, and so also ran the uh, the radio station as well as the director of public broadcasting for Texas Tech uh, University. And so I remember this just um, like yesterday because it was um, kind of an interesting situation. It was three years ago, and um, I had a program director, and she's still there, and she'd come back, and she'd make suggestions on programs that we should carry and we should run, and uh, there's one I kind of remember about. It was named after Tiller. I watched a little bit of it and, and, and really moved on and forgot about it. Well, then I started getting emails uh, from people about it, and so let's watch a little bit of the trailer. And this is before it actually ran. It actually ran on Labor Day uh, 2014, but this was a trailer uh, talking about after Tiller. George Tiller was a target of anti-abortion extremists. His Wichita clinic was bombed in 1985, and then at the age of 67, he was murdered at church. The death of Dr. Tiller leaves only four doctors in the country who are able to perform late-term abortions. There was absolutely no question in any of our minds that we were going to keep on doing this work. What really got me interested was when they started shooting doctors. I got five shots fired through the front windows of my office. Many, many times I felt so alone. How many times have you received threatening phone calls because of what I do? People call and I just hang up. When I walk out the door, I expect to be assassinated. Our goal is not merely to make abortion illegal, but to make it unthinkable. Major abortions, this is where everybody draws the line. They said I was an abomination and should be driven from the state. I immediately started getting death threats in the middle of the night. You don't give in because it only gets worse. If I just give up and stop doing anything after 20 weeks, some women may get desperate and do things on their own. There's something that needs to be done. What drives women to seek the third trimester abortion? Unless people understand what's going on for the woman, it's impossible to support it. It's guilt no matter which way you go. Guilt if you go ahead and do what we're doing, or bring him into this world and then he doesn't have any quality of life. You have choices. They all suck. Sometimes it's made it hard for me to feel that I could continue. Of course you don't want an abortion. Nobody wants an abortion. She had a disease where she can't bend at her joints. She could be a stillborn. Mm -hmm. She's just too far along. I can't help her. What's the right thing to do? What's really helping people? I just thought the other day, I can't retire, my God. <laughs> there aren't enough of them. So that was a show that um, done called POV, which is, uh, stands for Point of View, and which was a PBS uh, 
show that you could carry. It wasn't what was called uh, must carry. It was something that was it was up to us um, if we wanted to if we wanted to show it or not. And so I watched the um, after I started getting some emails from people protesting the fact that we, had, we were planning on showing it. I I asked for an advanced copy of the of the video and I watched it. I watched the whole thing and. Uh, and some of the things, and I don't know if you if you were paying attention there to some of the um, uh, literature that was coming up that you know the media was talking about with the show, but one of the one of the comments on there was regardless of your thoughts on abortion, uh, this is a must see show. And to me, I looked at it as not necessarily an abortion, a show about abortion. It was more a show about the doctors performing the abortion and what they were going on. And, um, the abortions and, and in the states that those doctors operated the abortions are legal and uh, so I looked at that part of it I looked at that aspect I looked just at the storytelling of it and I looked to make sure that the people that were against the abortions were not presented in a negative light sometimes you'll see that happen where one side or the other is made to seem as extreme and when you do it that way it almost diminishes their point of view if you're making them look really extreme uh, on either side. And so I felt like the uh, people opposing the abortions were not presented to be crazy or zany or too extreme. And so I, I went with the decision to show the program and uh, took some grief, took quite a bit of grief about it. Um, there's a lady here in town who who started a pretty decent letter writing campaign against me and uh, told our chairman of the board of regents that I have no moral compass or moral center. And, um, you know, I had people calling me asking me, uh, I had Texas Tech people calling me and asking me, hey, what is your thought on abortion? What is your stance on abortion? Is this why you were running the program? And my point then and my point is now and my point was that you saw it there on the screen has nothing to do with my thoughts one way or the other on abortion. It has to do with the television station and the program does the program meet all the requirements for what we're trying to do felt like it did felt like everything else was um, outside of the situation and that's something where uh, you are confronting your personal systems of morals and values and so all said and done it blew over uh, I took quite a bit of grief I think the lady uh, that was um, leading the charge will probably always uh, remember me and always be uh, looking out for me and I try to uh, pay attention in the parking lot when I walk out to the car uh, but for the most part it, it kind of blew over but it is an example where we do have to face some of these things and as a manager you have to make the decision you can't sit around and vote you can't say hey uh, we've got 20 employees uh, what do you guys think let's take a vote no you have to take all the information and you have to make the decision based on that sometimes not easy The study of ethics helps us by providing the means uh, to make difficult moral choices that confront us in our professional and, and personal lives. You know, some of these times, things are listed in the book or that people talk about when they're talking about ethics. Hey, I'm going to take something. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a computer or whatever. That's not, that's, to me, that's not really a difficult choice, right? You know right and wrong. And sometimes ethics helps you with that. Ethics and concern with basic questions about what is right and wrong it involves the char character and conduct of individuals and institutions. You know, sometimes you have to look at it beyond yourself. You have to look at it as I'm representing this institution, me at Texas Tech, wherever, your family, whatever it is, you're representing someone. So that is part of what is ethics. You know, people use that a lot. I love the Princess Bride. Sometimes people will say that's an ethical decision. It's really not. It's really, you know, it just depends on what you're talking about. So sometimes what I hear are ethical decisions to me really are not really that much um, um, gray area, and they're more black and white. Ethical issues when you kind of get into, hmm, this is a, a bit of a gray area. Ethics reflects typically what society's norms about what is morally right and wrong. Uh, several approaches to studying ethics. Um, normative ethics looks at overall society. You know what's what's relevant to our society here in the United States is 
completely different in a different part of the world. Um, ethics may also be examined in terms of organizations. Um, some places have an ethical code, others don't. And obviously your personal ethics is another area of ethics studies. I worked for a uh, gentleman once and had a pretty good job and he wanted me to uh, give our banker a falsified profit and loss statement for the company and make the company look better. And um, personally, I couldn't do that. Personally, I felt like I owed it to the banker for us to be uh, completely above board and honest with him. But my boss didn't feel that way. And so I had an ethical dilemma there with the organization. So an organization may decide, hey, we're going to have a code of ethics. We're going to write it out. Implied sometimes doesn't necessarily work. Hey, I thought that was implied. You can't do that. Um, when they're written, it makes it a little easier to understand. Um, when group or organizational ethic codes exist, conflict may arise between the organization's approaches and the, visual, and the individual's moral beliefs. Whether that would be, whatever that might be, you can think about just in your own mind, places you work, things you do, that you have to make a decision. It's just like life, right? If you don't, if you're not a drinker in a party or you go out with people and they're trying to get you to drink and party and all those things. You have to make the decision, what's right for me? What's right for my moral beliefs? The book identifies five ethical duties of mass media employees. This is at all levels, managers, non-managers, and everyone in between. First of all, you have a duty to yourself. Media professionals need to, in, with individual integrity and the strength to follow their conscience. And, and I wouldn't just say this is just, um, media either this is this is everyone right you have to you have to what are your whatever your business you're in you're an accountant you're a insurance salesman you're a tree cutter you have to have a duty to yourself with us though because we do have an audience and we've talked about that as a dual product market we have an audience the audience subscribers and other supporters must be considered when deciding a particular course of action Think about that. I'm going to show this video of somebody being shot. I'm going to show video of a car accident. I'm going to put in my written document this really offensive narrative that from a court case or something like that. You have a duty to the audience. And do you have to, do you need this to tell the story? You have a duty to your employer or organization. Um, Responsible employees have a sense of obligation to their employers, um, and sometimes you may do something that personally doesn't fit what you want, but you do work for the company and you need to do what the company wants. Um, you also have an obligation to your colleagues, people you're working with, people you work with on a day-to-day -day basis, people that are in your business, and uh, you need to make the right decision for them. Think about that if you're in a sales situation and you're willing to accept some kind of gift back that um, maybe your coworkers or even your competitors wouldn't accept, is it the right thing to do? And then you have a duty to society. Some issues call into question um, our duty to society, individual rights, privacy, confidentiality, scenes of sex and violence. This goes back to the other thing as well with the audience. The, the audience basically is reflective of society. You know, there was a couple years ago where um, the young reporter was out on a live shot and uh, with the video of the guy coming up behind him with the, with the gun and shooting. And, um, you know, the television stations eventually made the decision, well, let's stop showing this. This is something that is not great. This isn't a, it's a good thing to show. It's not helping. People have individual rights of privacy. There are also some factors that complicate the making of ethical decisions by managers. Um, ethical decisions have extended consequences and these affect everyone throughout the organization and society. You're not generally, you don't hardly ever make a decision that's just for today. You're making a decision today that you're going to live with for weeks, months, years down the road. 
So generally, most ethical decisions do have extended consequences. Ethical decisions have many alternatives a lot of times. Um, you have to look at everything and then make a decision. A few decisions involve a, a simple yes or no. You know, when going back to that after chiller, uh, I was given several choices. Hey, don't air it at all. Uh, air it online only. Air it later in the night. Don't air it at 9 o'clock on Monday night, but rather 2 a.m. Wednesday morning. Uh, a lot of different, a lot of different choices, and I went with the one that I thought was the right one, which was airing it where the show typically airs 9 o'clock on Monday night. Ethical decisions often have mixed outcomes. Um, many decisions produce both benefits and costs that you don't really see and you don't necessarily know about before you have to deal with them. And they have uncertain consequences. Almost every ethical decision is not free of some type of risk. Uh, you can't always predict the full consequence of your actions. Going again back to the show, I couldn't tell you, hey, it's going to be okay. We're going to air this show, and it's going to be okay. It was uncertain. I didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know if people were going to bomb the the television station. I didn't know if uh, people were going to boycott. I didn't know if underwriters were going to pull out. I didn't know if I was going to lose my job because you get to the right person and that you're upset. You don't know. And then again, ethical decisions are intertwined with the values, beliefs, and other personal, personal qualities of managers. Look, none of us live in a bubble. We all understand uh, that people have feelings. We all understand that People are emotionally invested in different things. And so you have to decide. You, you, that's good. That's what makes us people. They go, hey, I'm struggling with this because I know you're going to struggle with my decision. And that's a good thing. It's a good thing that people wrestle with those decisions and those thoughts because um, we're people and that's what makes us that's what makes us interact. We all have our own thoughts, judgments, and processes. Ethical norms are a means of making informed decisions, and so we're going to breeze through some of these. They're the ethical norms that, that people use to make these decisions, and they're also what forms the basis of many of our societal beliefs, and uh, what they are really is a set of theories derived from the study of ethics and ethical principles, and really when you get into grad school theories and this kind of thing really becomes much more prevalent than when we are here. Um, but we're going to go over some of these. First one is the golden mean. The golden mean stresses moderation as opposed to extremes or excess. Um, basically, the rule there is by adopting a middle position, on an, in, an individual could avoid both excess and deficiency. An example, balanced and fair news reporting. Journalists are objective. And we could argue this point all day long, and, and especially this part of the country, uh, you know, people really negative towards the media. Um, I do think for the most part that most journalists do get into reporting to be objective and to be able to tell a story and to be able to right the wrongs and those kind of things. And I do think most of them get into it for the right reasons. I think when they're in it, maybe they get some of those things get lost in the, in the shuffle. But you see it all the time that stations and networks do try to, to show the golden mean. You know what? We're not going to be too much one way or the other. Uh, does it work all the time? No. But I do think most people really strive for that. You have the Judeo-Christian ethic, and it appears in both Jewish and Christian scriptures as do unto others as you would have them do unto you. You respect. You show dignity for all people. Um, if you make a decision based upon this ethic, you have to consider how your decision impacts others. Again, we talked about this earlier. That's a good thing. It's good that you're wondering uh, how people think about this. TV programming that degrades certain groups, genders, minorities. That violates the Judeo-Christian ethic. And 
you see this a lot. You don't see it as much anymore. You see it if you watch older television, you see, wow, that's unbelievable that um, they're going to take a shot like that, that that particular group would become. Some people might say this is more politically correct. I think right here it's just more following the Judeo Christian ethics. So that's another ethical norm that you can follow. Um, utilitarianism established by John Stuart Mill in the 19th century. When faced with moral decisions, an individual must consider which actions will result in the most happiness for the greatest number of people. What do you think about that? So after Tiller, in a town like Lubbock, Texas, the most happiness for a great number of people is not show the program. Um, also called the greatest good approach. This might be a test question for us, but which, which one of these ethical norms is uh, also called the greatest good approach? Unlike the categorical imperative, utilitarianism is concerned more with the consequences of an ethical decision than with the process of the decision making. So a lot of times you think about what's going on and you think about what the result is. And that's what utilitarianism is, is that, okay, forget all these other things. It's going to make this number of people happy. We're going to go with that. Majority rule is another great um, little line to associate with it. So again, only the programs would best serve the needs of the majority of the public would be broadcast. So you can think about those and think about what would be um, some of those type of programs that would be like, hey, okay, this is gonna this is gonna be good for everyone. Egalitarianism was established by the work of John Rawls, asserts that everyone must be treated equally and fairly when we form ethical judgments. Rawls introduced it, introduced, introduced it, introduced a hypothetical concept known as the veil of ignorance. By wearing a veil when considering a decision, an individual can eliminate possible biases or discrimination and therefore treat all persons in an equal manner. It really sounds good, right? That you're not going to um, you're not going to uh, take into account who's feeling what. But without the veil of ignorance, minority viewpoint and those representing weaker points of view may be ignored or overlooked. You don't know. Um, you know, sometimes there is a a certain maybe responsibility to look out for the little guy, look out for the people maybe that might be underrepresented. The veil allows for decisions to be made impartially without cultural biases. And again, it goes back to news should present all sides fairly and, equally, and accurately. That's not, that's not a bad thing. Relativism, the works of John Dewey and Bertrand Russell developed the philosophy of relativism. Relativists believe that what is best for one is not necessarily as best for another. Each individual decides what is best from his or her viewpoint and does not judge others' decisions. This concept has given rise to situational ethics, which examines ethical decisions in individual situations. Um, great example, program director must decide what type of music is played on radio stations and depending on the audience might decide not to play certain songs. But other times of the day, they might play them. Again, it's applied situationally. And so you have to think about it and say, hey, certain day parts, certain people are going to be listening. Certain other day parts are not going to have that problem. Social responsibility theory was derived by the Hutchins Commission, which examined freedom of the press in the 40s. The commission found that journalists and other practitioners generally make responsible decisions that serve society, and I, and I still do believe this today. The commission recognized that though individuals in the media cannot correctly determine the exact impact of their decisions, they make them with good intentions. Um, all managers who engage in responsible behavior and expect the same type of behavior from all employees act on this norm. Again, I, I think that with all the heat the media takes. And, and look, there are fake news sites. There are places that make news up, but when CNN or Fox News or MSNBC or whatever makes a mistake, 
it's not because they're making it up. It's because they made a mistake. And I do believe that the people that work in those places on both sides, left and right, do have a social responsibility. And I believe they live by that and they try to practice that. So ethical norms usually fall into two categories of philosophical thought. I have a hard time pronouncing these deontological in terms of the process of making decisions based on established principles. And then teleological is concerned with the action or consequences of making decisions. So one is the process, the other is the actions or the consequences. And sometimes you can't really, and I know you do have to think about the the um, actions. You can't just make your decisions in a bubble. You have to say, here's what happens if I say A, this is what happens. And so that may not guide your final decision, but you do have to keep that in mind. Ethical codes of conduct and mission statements are ways that companies publicly define their, their business values. We have a mission statement here at Texas Tech Athletics, educate, serve, and grow fearless champions. And that follows, and then we have guiding principles that go under that. And the very first one is do the right thing. And so it's kind of like a code of ethics, but they're written statements to define conduct for an organization and its members. There are several professional codes of ethics that exist in the electronic media industries. All these places have uh, Society of American Professional Journalists, American Society of Newspaper Editors. You can read those. All have kind of a written code and the ethical code that they live by. And so most businesses try to impart those into their organization. We're going back, you have a mission statement. Educate, serve, and grow fearless champions. Mission statement identifies an organization's purpose and values. And for us in the athletic department, we do play sports, but we are looking out for what's best for our student athletes. So we have a mission statement, educate, serve, and grow fearless champions, but we also have Guiding principles, do the right thing, win, honor the past, all those things that are part of our, our mission statement and our code. Mission statement publicly displays the values of an organization. Mission statements kind of do the following. They define your purpose. They focus on the product or service that you are providing. You're responding to the needs of your various publics with interest in the organization. You provide a direction for making decisions and taking other actions. That's one of the things when, when we're going uh, through our decisions, we say, is this the right thing? Are we doing the right thing? And as you see in some other universities that win and are winning, but maybe not doing it the right way and maybe not doing the right thing, there's a difference. And other thing is the mission statement energizes all employees. Except for what? That's if you don't do anything with it, right? You put it on a piece of paper, you put it on a shelf, and then you're done with it. There are four areas that affect managerial decision-making. First of all, you have to serve the market or the marketplace. It can be difficult to serve the public interest when you also have to meet obligations to owners, stockholders, you're trying to make the business run, those kind of things. So if you're manager, again, you have to consider all those things. Controversies over programming. Programming uh, cause conflicts between personal ethics and those of the organization. Most relate to sex, violence, children's programming, etc. Again, we've talked about my own personal one there as well, but you have controversy over programming. I uh, also want to talk about those. So those are kind of tied into one. When, when you talk about the programming, you know, sexual content, what can be shown, what can't be shown, um, violence. We saw that with Walking Dead. I mean, it's a show about zombies, and they took a little grief for too much violence in the show. Uh, children's programming, uh, some of those restrictions have been released as far as what you have to do about that. And then social media content. And now you got to think about your people all the time. All the, these people are representing you and out there in the world. And how are you going to handle your social media content of your employees? Let's go to news now, too. We have uh, news and public affairs, always a great deal of pressure. Uh, you want to be truthful. You want to be accurate. But I think the days of 
unless you're working for a newspaper, getting a story, checking your sources, double checking your sources, all those, those are gone, right? That's uh, people trying to get out first, put things out. And I think that's what's hurt the news business more than, than anything. Shows you how old the book is. We've got this uh, Kobe Bryant story out here about the victim of the alleged rape on questions of privacy. Um, again, I do think it ties in, though, that the public doesn't really need to know everything. And so you want to make sure that you're, um, you're protecting uh, everyone involved. Conflicts of interest. Uh, journalists should avoid situations that produce a conflict of interest. Um, checkbook journalism, which means, hey, if you come out and do a story on our thing, I'll give you a vacation or whatever. Come to Disney and look at what we're doing and then do a story on us. Some states have shield laws that protect reporters from revealing the names of their sources, so you want to make sure that um, if you tell a person that you're going to be uh, protecting them, that you will protect their uh, them as a source, and that's uh, huge in news. And you always have pressures from advertisers. Um, GM's one time was a major NBC advertiser, and NBC did a story on uh, GM trucks that was not necessarily complimentary, and so made it kind of uh, tough sledding there for a while. I used to have, uh, years and years ago, I was in sales, and uh, one of my big clients was um, an apartment complex, and they had a rape in their apartment complex and our reporter did a stand up right in front of the apartment complex and so late at night I get a phone call from the owner of the of the apartments going, What the hell's going on here? You gotta avoid pressure from uh, advertisers. And, and again, now you have to deal with citizen journalists. Everyone's got a phone, everyone's got a tablet, everyone's got an opportunity to be a journalist. So you have to deal with those things as well. Dual product market, saying it again, we have sales, and so you have salespeople going out selling advertising or selling your product to advertisers, and so there are five levels of accountability for sales. You're, you're accountable to your audience. Again, you're accountable to your conscience. You're accountable to the commercial media that you're in. You're accountable to your customers, and you're accountable to the company that you work for. So ethical decisions making in electronic media obviously can be very complicated, and uh, you try to put these things in. And But for the most part, you want to just tell people, do what's right. Do the right thing. Um, companies that adopt a plan to help guide them through these dilemmas deal with ethical issues better than others. And again... If you're going to put a program in, state the mission, clarify the values of what you want, create a code of ethics, and develop an ethics program. Those are ways uh, to get that done. Again, typically here we would say questions. Um, if you have them, put them on the message board, email me. I am going to ask you on the on the on the message board to say. Uh, what are some, uh, what's an ethical issue or dilemma that you've had to deal with either in school that you feel comfortable about or just in life and, and how do you deal with those things and maybe a two-part question, how do you see news and, and news media dealing with a certain ethical issue? So that is going to do it for today's uh, lecture. Again, don't forget to get your paper turned in and uh, we will talk to you tomorrow.